Nothing was going right in my life. I had hit rock bottom. You know, I was on the outs with my wife. I'm scared to death my family's getting torn apart and, you know, think that there's nothing I can do about it and that it's 100% my fault. I stopped drinking because I was trying to save my failing marriage. And I firmly believe that it is a divine intervention thing that remove the desire to drink from my body because I was never able to do it on my own. It was just taken away and I can't explain it and that's how I explain it. It has to be God. I'm a union electrician. I ended up working on Chapel Street Church's 11,000 square foot addition that they did in 2014. I wasn't necessarily sure what to expect and who I'd be working with, how they were going to treat me. And I walk in and, you know, I'm surrounded by all these Christians. When I'm in the lowest point in my life, things just are a wreck. And the overwhelming support that I got from these people and the services available, like divorce care through Chapel Street, were unexpected, unbelievable, and desperately needed. At first, it seemed strange, you know, I'm coming to church to go to work, and you know, I'm around all these people that are super nice, but they really are that way. They're really, this is how these people are. They're really, they're really nice people. They really believe in God, and um, more than willing to help you with anything that you may need. Did seem a little awkward, I hadn't been surrounded by people that were that way, I don't think ever. Talking to James really got me through some struggles. Always involved praying, you know, and the result was less anxiety and, you know, focus where it needs to be on God, God's plan, and you're going to get through this no matter what. It was surreal in the sense that all of the misery and the drama of getting divorced and the hell I was going through could not triumph over the positives of developing that relationship with Jesus and meeting all these lifelong friends that I can call upon and say, hey, <laughs> I really need your help. I needed emotional and spiritual support from God through these people. That's what I got, and it's so unexpected. This is just how I am now. You know, my focus is on God, and I'm closer to God now than I've ever been in my entire life. It's all from people I met at Chapel Street Church. Well, I want to say a special welcome to those who are joining us at our Mill Creek campus and our Kesslinger campus this morning. Uh, I love Dan's story. Dan uh, Simon is part of our church family now. He was a little reluctant to be on camera, but I'm so grateful that he told his story. And if you caught that, his first exposure to really the love of God and to our church was when he was hired to be an electrician on one of our additions, one of our expansion projects. And it was in that context that he began to be around people that he'd never been around before in his life, people like you, who loved him and met him at a time when he most needed it. I love the way he articulated that, and we're grateful that Dan's part of us. Dan's daughter was baptized at our stadium service just this past summer, so it's a story that's ongoing, and we praise God for that. Thanks, Dan, for being courageous enough to share your story with all of us. I don't know if you pay attention to trends in the church today. Maybe, maybe you look at trends on Twitter or trends in, uh, you know, home decor or something like that. I pay attention to trends in the church world or trends in the NFL, which hopefully the Bears are starting a new trend today. <laughs> But the trend in the church today in America is almost universal, and that is that attendance is on, is on the decline. It's going down. You see this graphic here that describes it. This is 2002, and it's worse today. And that is that only 6% of churches in America are growing at all. And of those 6%, only about 
1% are growing by what we would call reaching new people. The church in America, by all measurements, is in decline, at least if you're measuring attendance. Not that all churches look like this, but you get the idea. Only 6% are growing. And growing, by the way, they define this way. Growing means growing uh, in, uh, in congregation size at a rate at or larger than the, the community in which they live. But of those, only 1% or less are growing by what we would call reaching people. What this means is two things. That just to, One is 94% of the churches in America are not keeping pace with the communities in which they live and are called to serve. And it also means that most of the growth we experience is just reshuffling the Christian deck. Christians who were attending over here and go, I don't like that guy, he bothers me, I don't like that music, I don't like those programs, we're going to go down the street. And that happens all the time. Some of you are here because of that. And there's good reasons to leave a church, and I'm not saying that there aren't. I am saying, though, most of the times we see churches grow, it's just Christians shifting from one place to another. Very few are growing by reaching new people, which is why we're launching Explore God next week and many other initiatives that we have. But it's interesting to think about. And, I, and other trends include this. Do you know how every time you fill out a survey or there's always a place for religious affiliation and there's a box that says none? Have you noticed that? The number of people who click no, or check none is on the rise in our country. They call it the rise of the nuns and the duns. Done is not a box you check, but done, D-O-N-E, simply means I'm done with church. The number of people who would say I have no religious affiliation or I used to and I no longer do is increasing in our country. 39% of the U.S. population can be defined in what sociologists call post-Christian. That number is closer to 50% if you're talking about millennials, the younger generation. Post-Christian does not necessarily mean atheist or agnostic or antagonistic. It simply means those who presume to know what the Christian value and belief system is and have rejected it, discarded it, or worse, forgotten it. 20 years ago, one in nine people had never been to a church at all. Today, it's one in 3.6. I don't know how you get the 0.6 of a person, but you get the idea. More and more people are growing up in our culture without what you might call the muscle memory of a church background. Christianity, the, the phrase Christian nation, used to be taken for granted. It's no longer automatically true about our country. And there are those who even see this as a good thing. Because there are increasingly those who would say, you know, religion in general, and Christianity in particular, is part of what's wrong with the world today. And it's a good thing that we're leaving a lot of that behind. It's a good thing that we're getting less superstitious and we're kind of growing out of that. A good friend of mine who's a Christian and works in education in a neighboring community said to me uh, during the school board elections a couple years ago, he said, you know, 20 years ago, being a member of a local congregation would have been a prerequisite to getting elected to a school board. Today, it just might keep you off of it. And he's not exaggerating. The world is changing, and yet, here we are. Here you are. Here we are across our campuses in church. And I think we could ask the question, which many are asking, and it's worth asking this morning as we launch into a brand new year, what good is the church in the world? How exactly is the church supposed to function? And this is a, I know that it's not exactly you, you anal people that, it's not really the world, but you get the idea. How is the church supposed to function in a world that's increasingly post-Christian? How do we respond? How do we react? What do we do in a world that doesn't share the values that we used to see as sort of, even if people weren't Christian, they grew up that way, they had a sense of the lingo, they knew sort of the Judeo-Christian ethic, and that's not true anymore. How do we exist in a world like that? There are some who wish we could go back to the time when our nation was more Christian. Maybe that's some of you. I think that's a little bit of a myth when we were more or less Christian, but there certainly was a time when more people just accepted it as the norm. There are others who would say, you know, we should, go, we should actually withdraw and separate. That the way for us to preserve our identity as Christians is to disengage from the culture and withdraw. 
There are others who would say, no, no, actually, we've got to get with the times. We need to assimilate more to the culture. We've got to become more like, we've got to get on the right side of history and assimilate to the culture, and that's how we make the biggest impact. Croatian theologian Miroslav Volf, in a book he wrote called Exclusion and Embrace, writes, contemporary Christians tend to want to be in the center of culture, politics, and economics. But historically speaking, Christianity has been most effective from the margins of society. We hope that if we're close to power, we're going to have influence on the power. But almost all historical and sociological studies show that it works the other way around. So maybe it's not a bad thing that we don't see ourselves as the people in power. But what does God think? What does God's word have to say about how we should answer this question? How should the church exist in the world? There are many, many places we could go in the New Testament, but I actually want to take you to the Old Testament. And the verse I want to take you to might surprise you. It's from the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah. You can turn there if you have your Bibles or we'll follow along together. Jeremiah chapter 29. I'll read verses 1 through 14. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles and the priests, the prophets and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jeconiah and the queen, mother of the eunuchs, the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elasa, the son of Shaphan, and Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, I should have practiced these names, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, it said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives, have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you and do not listen to the dreams that they dream for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Now, what could be more relevant? I hardly have to say another word, right? You all get it, exactly how that relates to us today. I'm sure some of you are thinking, that's interesting, but what in the world does that have to do with the church in the 21st century in a post-Christian culture? Well, quite a lot, actually. Now, I'm sure, even if you didn't know the reference, many of you know at least one verse are familiar with it from that passage, aren't you? Verse 11. Do you remember that verse? For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. That's on every Christian graduation card ever, right? <laughs> but I hope you're going to see as we go, it, it doesn't mean what you think it means. You ever see Princess Bride? That verse. You keep using that verse. I do not think that verse means what you think it means. If you don't know that movie, you don't know what I'm talking about, but... Okay, in order to understand what, what this is saying and how it relates to us, we need to go back and do a little context work here, understand what's happening in the world at the time that this letter from Jeremiah, this prophecy, came to be. This is about 590 B.C. The Babylonian Empire was the dominant power in the world. The Assyrian Empire first, then the Babylonians, then the Persians. We're in the Babylonian uh, time now. You'll see a map here that shows a bit of the captivity. But the story behind this is that Israel had rebelled against the Babylonian captivity. Now, Israel is divided at this time into two kingdoms, the Israel in the north and Judah in the south. Judah is where Jerusalem is. The northern kingdom had already been conquered. The southern kingdom was occupied territory by Babylon, and they were supposed to pay tribute, but Jews being Jews didn't want to get with the program. They didn't want to pay tribute. They refused. And so Nebuchadnezzar marched two more times on Jerusalem. And the third time he said, enough is enough. And he took them captive. He took, this is called the Babylonian captivity, carried them away 
That's the Fertile Crescent there. That's the route they would have taken some 600 to 700 miles from Jerusalem to Babylon. Now, you might have noticed in the, in the text when we read it, there was specific mention of who was taken captive. It said the royal family and artisans, craftsmen, skilled metal workers. Did you catch that? So what's this saying? It's saying the Babylonians knew what they were doing. They were trying to put up once and for all a stop to this rebellion by the Jews that they had conquered, the Israelites. So they took specific people captive, the ruling class and the professional class. Why would they do this? Well, they're trying to do a kind of cultural assimilation. The idea is if we take the, the elites of society, the royals and the skilled professional workers, and bring them away, they'll intermarry, they'll adopt our customs, and in a generation or two, there won't be any more resistance because they'll be just like us. But the Jews knew what they were trying to do, and so when they took them captive, they didn't immediately move into Babylon. They settled on the opposite side of the Kabar Canal. And they had false prophets, people from within Jerusalem, the Israelites, saying to them, God's not going to leave you here. He's going to take you back in a year. And into that context comes Jeremiah's prophecy, a letter from God by the prophet Jeremiah to the people in exile. Very different context than how we want to understand it. So whatever I have plans to prosper you means, it probably doesn't mean prosperity on our terms. It definitely doesn't mean prosperity. It doesn't mean God's going to make you rich and happy all the time. It means he knows his plans, but it's not the plans you're being told. He says, don't listen to the false prophets. This is not God's plan. And in this passage that we read, God gives three things to the Israelites. Three, there's more than three, but three we're going to look at that I think are very relevant for us today. They each begin with the letter R, so as a little sort of teaser here, I'll put up the R for you. Three, three points, and I know they all start the same letter, and I know that's alliteration and it's pretty cliche, but I couldn't help myself. Three R's, and maybe it'll help you remember them as we leave here. That would have been shocking to the Jews and certainly are interesting and I think very relevant for us today. These three things give us a picture of what God wants to do and how he wants his people to live in the world, not just then, but in any time. Now you might be thinking, well, how is this relevant because this is an ancient culture in exile. We're not in exile. How, how, does, how do we relate to this? They're in a temporary captivity. That's not us. Actually, it might surprise you to find out that in the New Testament, all Christians are referred to as exiles, foreigners, and sojourners. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, reading from the New International Version, says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. What a great verse for us today. He, we're called exiles. Now the word exile in Greek literally means resident aliens, which sounds like a strange oxymoron combination, doesn't it? Resident aliens. In fact, if you, want, if you're, if you like to read and you're looking for a new, good book to read in this new year, Stanley Hauerwas, H-A-U-E-R-W-A-S, a uh, missiologist and theologian, wrote a book by this title called Resident Aliens. And the subtitle to his book is A Christian Assessment of Culture and Ministry for People Who Know Something Has Gone Wrong. I love that subtitle. So we're resident aliens. We live in the culture. We reside there, have homes and so on there. But we're also aliens to it. We're not exactly accustomed to living there. It's a weird juxtaposition. We're re resident aliens. And this brings us to the very first R that we're given here. The first one is God says to the Israelites and to us, reside there. In other words, you're not to see yourself as like a tourist in the world, a part-timer or somebody separate from it. Move in. Make it your home. Make it a better place by your presence. Did you, listen to verses 5 and 6 again from Jeremiah 29. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. Move in. Live there. 
Really make it your home. Don't think of it as the, the evil world you have to stay away from. Be part of that world. Do you remember in the Lord of the Rings movies, in the Two Towers, the second movie? I hope there's some other nerds here with me this morning. When, uh, when Merry and Pippin, the hobbits, are trying to convince Treebeard to get involved in the war against Saruman, now you know that I'm a nerd, right? And, he, and Treebeard says, it's not our fight. And he says, but you're part of this world. How can you stay aloof from it? In a way, that's what the pro- God is saying to the prophet Jeremiah, to those exiles and to us as exiles in the world today. You're part of that world. I put you there. So live, reside. Do you notice the verbs that are listed in those verses we just read? Verbs like build, plant, produce, multiply. This is the opposite of withdrawing and disengaging, isn't it? Live there. Care about that world. Make it better by your presence. Start businesses. Plant things. Grow things. Grow your family. Establish a residence. Really reside there. Now, if you think you're leaving in a year, as the false prophets are saying, you don't want to do that. You're like, let's just, let's just not get contaminated by the Babylonians until God saves us. But God's saying it's going to be actually 70 years. Most of you will die here, so live here. Make it better by your presence. That's what he's saying to us. I would put it this way. You cannot make a difference from a distance. If God has called his people in the world to make a difference in the world, you can't do that if you stand at a distance. You can't make a difference from a distance. How did God, when he wanted to show his salvation and grace to the world, he didn't just shout down, hey, quit screwing up. (laughs) He incarnated himself. The late Eugene Peterson translated in the message this way, John 1, 14. The word took on flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. I love that. It's at the heart of the gospel. In the book, The Art of Neighboring, which I read about five years ago, which really was part of the genesis of our talking about the neighborhood vision, there's a quote in the book that says, every Christian should be a gift to his or her neighborhood. And every church should be a gift to its city or community. Whether or not people ever attend here or give here, whether or not there's any immediate benefit to the institution of Chapel Street Church, we want to, by our very presence here, your home and our church, be a gift to this community. Really reside here. Make it better by our presence. That's why things like Shepherd's Heart and Buddy Break and many other programs that we have, and many people that, like Leah Lehman and Nate Lehman, leaving our staff. Leah left our staff. Remember, Leah used to play piano and led a wooden table service? They bought a coffee shop called Limestone Coffee in Batavia. It's not a commercial for them. The reason they did this is not to create a Christian coffee house where only Christians can go and drink Christian coffee. (laughs) It's to make the world better, to own a business, and to run it with integrity and joy in the world. So the question, I think, for us is this. What are we building? What are we planting? What are we producing? What are we increasing for the sake of the gospel? Is your home, you know, we changed our name to Chapel Street Church. It's not accidental. Every house, a chapel on its street. Your home, your life, where you reside. Are you, by your presence, a gift to the people around you? Is their life better because you live near them? Or do you even know their names? Do they have any idea who you are? God says to the exiles of Israel and to us as exiles today in the 21st century, live, live there, move in, make it better by your presence. I put you there for a reason. It really matters. Now, notice in verse 1 of chapter 29, it says that Nebuchadnezzar took them into captivity. Did you catch that? It's Nebuchadnezzar's fault. But then in verse 4 and verse 7, God says, I sent you there. I took you away. But which is it? Did the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar do it, or did God do it? Well, the answer is that God is directing and using the socio-political forces that affect our lives for his good purposes. We t- you tend to think about your house where you live because you chose it. You shopped for it, you picked it, not because of taxes or you wouldn't live in Illinois, but, you know, school systems, <laughs> proximity to your work, neighborhood, that kind of thing. But if God is sovereign over all things, is he also sovereign over your address? He is. He absolutely is. 
Acts chapter 17, the Apostle Paul speaking to the Athenians there, he says this, And he, God, made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling places, that they should seek God. God determined and allotted the boundaries of your dwelling place. You didn't choose it. In fact, even when you think about captivity and exile for the Babylonians, God is saying, I know that's horrible, but I'm still sovereign over that. I can still use it for my glory and my good. And that's certainly true of your life and where you live and where you work. So the first thing is reside there, live there, build, plant, produce, multiply there. Make the world better because you live where you live for the glory of God. The second R is a little bit of the other side of the coin, if you will. I'll put it this way, resist there. Now, I know that resist has political connotations today. That's not how I mean it. Resist there. What does this mean? At the same time God tells his people to reside and move in, he's also saying to them, don't forget this is not your ultimate home. Ultimately, I am going to come and bring you back to the place you came from. I am going to establish your true home. In fact, later in chapter 50 of Jeremiah, God says, I'm going to judge Babylon uh, harshly if it doesn't repent of its wickedness. There's a real tension here. Live, move in, make it better. But don't forget it, you don't really belong there. You have a different home. It's not your true home. This means God wants, wants us to move in and reside and make the world better and always at the same time remember that we have an ultimate allegiance that's greater than this world, this nation, this community. Resident alien, right? That's the alien side of it. It would be easier, wouldn't it, just to pick a side? Wouldn't it be easier just to say, let's just separate ourselves off and have Christian schools and Christian communities and Christian neighborhoods and Christian towns? Uh, my kids go to Christian schools. nothing wrong with Christian schools. But if every Christian withdraws from every part of society, how are you going to make a difference? How's the world going to be impacted? We could do that. We could just withdraw. Or it might, many of us think, you know what, it'd be easier just to assimilate, just to become like those around us. But God is calling us to a different way. John chapter 17, verses 14 through 16, Jesus says it this way, I have given them, meaning us, your word. And the world has hated them because you are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Do you see that line? I do not ask that you take them out of the world. The promise isn't that God is going to come and wipe out all the, out of the world and take us out. He's going to come and bring the new heavens and new earth to us. So the promise is not that he's going to take us out of the world, but that he's going to bring new heavens and new earth to the world, and we're part of that. One of the most helpful images of how to live this way because it's a real tension, and I think we tend to fall off one side or the other, is the metaphor of what the Bible calls ambassadors. We think we know what that term means. But an ambassador is somebody who lives in country A, but represents the interests and values of country B in country A. But a good ambassador loves country A cares deeply about the people of country A, is fluent in the language of country A, actually lives and resides in country A. But a good ambassador also never forgets that he or she has an allegiance to a different belief and value system. Here's how the Apostle Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. I love that phrase, God making his appeal through us. God saying something to the world through your life. What appeal is God making through your life to those that live around you? I know what he's trying to make, but if you, exa if you examine your life, what, what's the appeal of our lives in this world? I think there's two key areas in which well, maybe three. You could probably guess them. In which this is most, we most need to resist. Money, sex, and power. There's no places 
than those three areas that are most obvious that we belong to a different Lord. We serve a different set of values. We're, we reside in a different home, if, as it were, than what our culture says about money, sex, and power. You know, Rodney Stark in his book, The Rise of Christianity, talks about the early Christians in the pagan Roman society who were growing in number, but they were still minority and viewed by the, the Roman elites as a problem, a blight on society. Yet they could not deny there was something compelling about their lives. In fact, one of the key things Stark points out is that Roman society in general, people were very promiscuous with their bodies sexually, but they were stingy with their wealth. He said the early Christians were exactly the opposite. They were remarkably stingy with their bodies, one man, one woman for life. But they were incredibly promiscuous, if you will, generous with their wealth. They cared for poor, even non-Christian poor. This was not done in the Roman society. So they, they really lived there, they really resided there, but there was something different about their lives. So you can't make a difference from a distance. You also can't make a difference if you're no different, if you aren't any different than anyone else. God's saying to the people of Israel who are living in Babylon, live there, make the world better by your presence, but never, never forget who God is, who you serve. And don't assimilate and become like the culture around you. Romans 12, verse 2, right? Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world. Be different because you know who you serve and whose you are. I see people so often that come to our church present company excluded, of course. Right? And they even get involved here. And they like the church. They make friends here. But when you examine their lives, when you look closely at the things they are pursuing and they care about, they give their time and money toward, they fully assimilate it. They're no different. Because we tend to think of church as like helping me in my spiritual journey. People say this kind of thing to me. I like Chapel Street because it helps me in my relationship with God. Well, I'm very glad that it does. But the agenda is not your individual needs. The agenda is not your own spiritual journey. The agenda is God's family and plan in the world. It's so much bigger than just you or me. If you ask the average person why they go to church, surveys say, they say, I go closer to God, I like the worship, it's good for my kids, they have all kinds of reasons. But it's all driven by consumer statements, things that I get from it. Nobody ever says, well, because I belong to Jesus. And the church is his family. The church is his body. I have to be part of it. Nobody talks that way. But that's exactly the way the New Testament talks about what good the church is. It's the people of God coming together and making a statement by our worship and by his word and by our shared life that Jesus is king. That we care about this world. We live in this world. We want to make a difference in this world. But we resist it too. We don't become just like it. We, we, we're showing by our lives and our worship there's a different way. And it's a better way. This brings us to the last R. Redeem. I had so much fun thinking about our words. I thought about restore, reflect, you know, resurrect, reimagine, reconnoiter, but that wouldn't make any sense. Redeem. God has a massive global restoration and redemption project that he invites his people, called the church, to join him in. Now someday he will come and complete it. But between this day and that day, our job is not to just hide away until he comes back to do the work for us. It's to join him in that restoration and redemption project. To make a difference. The center verse, the central verse, the heart of the text in Jeremiah 29 is not verse 11 that everybody knows in quotes. It's actually verse 7. I'm going to read it. You can follow with me. Verse 7. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare you will find your welfare. If you like to underline or highlight or circle in your Bible, you should star that one. This is at the heart of what we are called to be as the church. Seek the welfare of the city, community, neighborhood, place into which I have sent you. Pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find yours. Now, some of you might know this, but if you read the New International Version, that was the English Standard Version, the word is not welfare, it's peace and prosperity. It's a single Hebrew word every time. Peace, prosperity, welfare. And some of you will know this word. You know the word? Shalom.
shalom doesn't just mean, as we talked about this at Christmas Eve, the absence of conflict or let's not fight. It's translated peace most often. It means full and complete flourishing. Economic, social, emotional, mental, spiritual, the total well-being. So to say to someone shalom is to say I wish you to be, to flourish in every way. Completely whole. Think about that for a minute. God is saying to his people living in exile, seek the shalom, the full flourishing of the people who took you captive. That's pretty shocking. Now every Jew would have known Psalm 122, 6, which says, pray for the peace, shalom of Jerusalem. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And then the next part of that verse says, let those who love you find peace. That makes sense. Those who love me, those who I love, my kind of people, Bears fans, not Packer fans, you know, the people that are on the right side of the political aisle, those that are my kind of people, they should find peace. Pray, I'll pray for them. That's not what God says to these exiles and to us, indirectly but still importantly. Seek the full flourishing of the society who does not share your values. Pray earnestly, not just that God strikes down the people who don't believe like you believe. Pray for their shalom of those who have a different worldview than you, who think you're crazy, who even might oppose you and your value system. Seek their full flourishing. Work for it. Pray for it. How radical is that? That's what God is after. That's, by the way, the heart of the gospel. The heart of the gospel is not God came to save those that were his kind of people. They cleaned up their act and acted holy and righteous. No, Romans 5, 8, while we were yet sinners, when we were a mess, broken, and resistant to God, he died for us. Seek the shalom of the place where I have sent you, for in its welfare you find yours. What does that mean? In the flourishing and growing, as, the, as a community grows economically, socially, in every way, and spiritually, as more and more people in that community come to understand who God is, explore God, discover his grace and peace, and align their lives with him, that's good for you. It's good for society. It's good. Now, there are some of us who we get, we get resistant. I see this all the time, and angry. We look out at the world, we watch Fox News, and we think, you know, the, the, everyone's out to get Christians. And we walk around bitter and resentful, feeling like we lost something. That is not the way God calls us to live in the world. Angry, bitter, resentful, wishing for a different time. He calls us to reside there, plant, produce, multiply, make it better. Also resist, respectfully, joyfully resist, though I'm not going to align and assimilate with everything about this culture because I serve a different Lord. But to be part of his redemption project, to pray for the people who oppose, to the pray for the people who think differently, to work and actively seek their good, their full flourishing, because that's the way we grow. That's God's plan for the church. It's precisely what Jesus did, isn't it? Hanging on the cross, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. There's no more appropriate way for us to close than by coming to the Lord's table. We're going to do this across all three campuses and after I pray, we'll, we'll come to the table and we'll receive communion. I just want to remind you before I pray and we close this. It does not matter to us if you're part of our church, a member of our church, or here for the first time. This is not our table. The table belongs to Jesus Christ, and the stipulations that he makes are two. One, that you understand who he is, have received him as Lord and Savior, and trusted him for the forgiveness of your sins. And two, that you're willing to examine your own heart, where you sit, in your own way, be honest before God and confess. If that's true of you, then we welcome you to his table as we remember through bread and cup the redemption of the Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for pouring out on us grace we don't deserve, for loving us when we were far from you, for doing for us what we could never do for ourselves. And you've not just done this for us individually, Lord, but collectively called us into your family, sons and daughters, brothers and sisters. You call us your body, and you place us in the world, that by the, our very lives, the words we speak and the way we live, we would communicate what it is we're about to celebrate, the depth of your grace and mercy and love. We thank you, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.